Hey, how's it going? Welcome back to my channel. Whether you're a fresher or an almost graduate, this video is for you. Today, I'm going to be sharing my personal ultimate guide to OU study. So strap yourselves in. This is going to be a long video. Why should you trust me? Well, I was awarded a first class honours for my bachelor's of science in psychology and if that isn't proof enough, here are some of my assignment results from the last three years of study. I should note that I'm in no way associated with the Open University. Everything in this video is built through my personal experience with the system and how I got through it. That's also why it's taken me a long time to get this video out. There was a lot of writing. Why am I doing this? Well, I want to help you do the best that you can in your OU study. I personally know how confusing everything can be and if you've watched my OU review video you also know that I definitely know how frustrating studying with the OU can be. I only wish that this kind of video existed when I was studying in the OU but that's why I'm here and I'm here for you. In this video I'll be sharing my personal tips on how to to write TMA essays. I've stuck time codes in the description so that you can easily just go to the section of the video that you want. If you hover over the timeline of this video, you'll be able to see that it's split up into sections. So if you need to get straight into the TMA tips, you can do that. Yay technology! Are you ready? Let's get started. Firstly, let's talk about your module website. Some module websites are meant to supplement the textbooks that are given to you, while others completely rely on the module websites to give you the information that you need to know. This was basically the case for me when I was taking E209, Psychology of Childhood and Youth. E209 was a completely online module, meaning that all the relevant materials for my study was on the module website. There was no physical textbooks that were sent to me, though if I'm not mistaken, you can order a print-on-demand textbook if you're in the UK. But otherwise, in general, you should never ignore your module website. It houses a lot of audio-video materials that can be extremely helpful when writing your assignments. Sometimes you'll get more out of those than you do from your textbooks. Again, E2 9 comes to mind. If I remember correctly, a lot of the E2 9 assignments also needed you to draw upon video materials given to you, though they weren't necessarily OU made. Sometimes there are assignments that want you to draw upon video materials or audio materials, and that's what I had to do for my first TMA in E313. It was mostly linking an athlete family to a specific sport psychology theory, so I had to bounce a lot between the video and the textbooks material. Next, let's talk about module materials and textbooks. In OU speak, the module materials are the textbooks that the university will send you, as well as the audio video materials that you'll find on your module website. Since I've just spoken about the audio video materials in the previous section, this section is just about textbooks. If you're taking a psychology degree, textbooks are the foundation of your study. Since the OU is a distance learning institution, there's less emphasis on attending classes and more on content. The textbooks coupled with the audio video materials that I mentioned earlier is your study. All of your learning will come from here and therefore all your citations for your TMA will come from here as well. I have to admit that I'm a bit strange because I actually enjoyed every aspect of my OU study in terms of materials but if you are on any Facebook group there will be no end to people talking about how boring all the materials are but I guess that a good rule of thumb would be that if it's boring, it's really important that you learn it. Don't be afraid to highlight your textbooks and take notes as you go. And when you take notes, take lots of them. Notes will help you gather and organize your thoughts on the topic at hand. For me personally, I prefer taking notes on physical notebooks, but if you prefer to take notes on your laptop, you can do that as well. Just make sure that you organize the files so that they're easy to get to and you can easily link your notes back to the relevant bits of 
loved textbooks. I liked to write down notes as I'm reading the relevant textbook chapter of the week. Another good rule of thumb would be to paraphrase your notes but I find that it's a bit more difficult to be able to trace back your notes that way unless you note down the page number of the textbook. That is very important for your TMA writing, which we'll get to in a moment. Now let's talk about tutorials. Tutorial attendance isn't compulsory, but I would definitely recommend that you attend them whenever possible, especially if your module doesn't record them. Even if they do, I would still recommend attending them live because sometimes you'll think of questions on the fly that you might not be able to think of otherwise and you'll be able to get an instant answer. Personally, I much preferred attending them as my friend Sienna can attest to. They make a huge difference to how you move forward with your TMAs. As I mentioned in my OU review video, I had a tough experience attending attending tutorials during my level three study. The lesson that I learned from that is that as a student, I had every bloody right to get a tutorial set up to a timing that was more suited to me. Throughout my study experience, I know that I wouldn't have been the only person to benefit from a morning tutorial. And that was indeed the case throughout my level one and two studies. I should mention that morning UK time would be evening where I did a majority of my personal study. So imagine my horror when I saw that all my level three tutorials were in evening UK time. I had to force myself to stay up past midnight in order to attend them. So if you find yourself in the same position that I was and you notice that you might be faced with a whole year of not being able to attend tutorials, I say make a fuss. If you have friends studying the same module as you, I recommend that you have them make a fuss as well. Contact the relevant module team and demand an extra set of timings. You have every right to a wholesome study experience and tutorials play a significant part of your OU experience. They have no excuse not to cater to your needs as their students and don't stop until your needs are met. You are are the reason why the OU exists as an institution. Without students to study, there will be no university. I wish that I could have told myself this in the past, but hopefully you can learn from my mistakes and create a better experience, not just for yourself, but for your fellow classmates as well. Because trust me, you will be helping other students. Now, Let's talk about assignments. While my personal experience is with Q07, Bachelors of Science in Psychology, I do think that these tips can apply to most other psych-related degrees as well. Maybe even to most social science degrees. In OU study, students will be assessed throughout their study via TMAs or tutor marked assessments. For psychology students, this means writing a lot of essays based on what you've learned. For this segment, I'm gonna be using a question that I got during my E209 studies, since apparently the OU doesn't recycle questions. So that means that I probably won't get into trouble. And the question is, Discuss the extent to which infants create categories about the world from limited experience. The word limit was 2,000 words. Let's go through this step by step. Firstly, analyze the TMA question. The first thing that you always want to do when you have a, your TMA question at hand is to break the question down. Ask yourself these questions. Are there any terms that I need to define? To be honest, the answer to this question is always yes. No matter what level you might be writing at, you always have to write your essays as if like you're explaining something to a complete newbie. This is difficult to keep in mind trust me, but it is important nonetheless. Always, 
always take your definitions from your textbooks. Never use a dictionary, even if it's a psychological dictionary. If you can't see an obvious definition within the chapter, try using the search box on your module site. That will either send you straight to the point of the textbook where they've defined the term that you're looking for, or it'll bring you to the glossary. For the example question, the term that we need to define is categories. You might also want to clarify what age group infants are because lay people tend to have a different idea of who is considered an infant, although there is an official psychological definition for this. Secondly, what is the TMA question actually asking me to do? There are a handful of terms that your TMA essay will throw at you, all of which require you you to answer your TMA question in a specific way. These words are called directive words and there are a lot of them. There's assess, define, analyze, evaluate, critically evaluate and the list goes on and on. For the example question we have discuss which requires you to discuss both sides of the argument, the pros and the cons, the positives and the negatives. These questions could be considered a self-debate as you're not actually debating with anyone else, but no matter which side you'll be writing about, there will always be evidence, so search for them. For discuss questions, it is imperative that you balance your essay as much as possible. Try not to go too much one way or the other but don't worry if you have like one extra point in the negatives compared to the positives the key here is trying to avoid leaning too much in one direction meaning two or more points tipping to one side question number three how should i structure the essay every essay should be similar in structure there's the introduction followed by the body and then round it off with a summary and a conclusion i'll explain the structure in more detail in the section academic writing 101 and you should not deter from this structure. Remember that each point that you make needs to link back to the question at hand. You should be mindful not to waffle on too much. Your essay point should always be to the point. Keep it concise yet informative. Question four. What will my primary resources be? Throughout my QO7 study, most of my TMAs were heavily based on module textbooks. I should note that the further along your study you are, the more that you should be referencing external sources. This means finding information outside of your OU materials. Studies, other textbooks from other universities, Psychology Today, as long as it's a reputable source, it is usable and useful for your TMA. I would personally lean more towards finding studies to use as evidence. Studies that are published tend to be peer-reviewed and would have gone through an extensive editing process before they're put into a journal. The only downside to this is that you'll have to go through a lot of academic jargon before you're able to pick out the points that you need from the study. A lot of people do not like doing this, but if you want to make the most out of your TMA, you should make a habit of it. Plus, you might learn a thing or two that you can add to your personal psychology trivia to use and parties. So those are the questions I generally ask myself before tackling a TMA question. Now let's get on to writing it. Academic writing 101. No matter what module you take in the psychology field, the structures are generally the same. Introduction, body, summary, conclusion. The latter two are sometimes considered the same, but in my opinion, they're not. I learned this during my E219 study and it served me well during my DE200 assignments as well. So here's a quick rundown of each section. The introduction is where you introduce the topic at hand. Here you define the overall topic that you'll be discussing and give a sort of sneak peek to the contents of 
of your essay. Secondly, the body is the bulk of your TMA. Here is where a lot of your marks will come from. So don't waste them by waffling on, on things that aren't relevant to answering the question. I know from experience that that is really difficult to do, but you do need to do it in order to maximize your word count. There's a strategy that you'll see throughout your OU studies, Peel, that you should really use when structuring your TMA essay. Peel stands for point, where each paragraph should contain only one point and you should always start your paragraphs with your point. For point two onwards, it is good practice to link back to the previous point. Next is E, explain. Sometimes tutors will call this elaborate rather than explain because you need to do just that. Elaborate on your point a bit further. What do you mean? Is there another term that you need to clarify? Define that here. Any idea that is not personally yours should be correctly referenced and we'll talk about referencing in the next segment of this video. Next is evidence. Again, every point that you make needs to be backed by evidence. You can source your evidence from information that you've learned from your textbooks or from external studies relating to the topic. Reference your evidence appropriately. And finally, link. Relate your point to the question at hand. Why is this point relevant to answering the TMA question? Mention that here. Then briefly touch upon your next point and then start the process again. Finally, your TMA summary does exactly as advertised, summarizing all the points that you've discussed within your body. Try to condense each of your paragraphs into one sentence points and then moving on to conclusion, always end your TMA essays on what you believe the overall body of text has taught you. Are you leaning more towards yes? Are you leaning more towards no? Why? Why not? Is there enough evidence? Mention that here. And now let's talk about referencing. Referencing 101. While there are a number of referencing styles used in the world of academia, the one that you'll see most in scientific research is the APA. There are also MLA and Harvard referencing styles, the latter of which that you'll be using throughout your OU study. Starting October of 2020, the OU will be transitioning to the Cite Them Write Harvard Guide, which will soon replace the OU Harvard Guide completely. I've linked that resource in the description below. From what I gather, it's still the Harvard system in essence. Since I can't spot any visible difference between the two, that is what I'm going to do in this video. Before I begin, I should tell you that you should double check which citation style your model is using, cite them right or OU Harvard. Ask your tutor during your introductionary email, forum posts, so that you are aware from the get-go. Anyway, let's get down to it. There are two different but interlinking kinds of referencing. In text, where you cite your reference point within the body of your TMA in short form, and full reference, which then shows the full complete information of where you obtain your reference. Referencing is extremely important in order to avoid plagiarism. Plus, a lot of the ideas that you'll be writing in TMAs will generally not be your own, so it's just overall good practice to let people know where your evidence comes from. So let's talk about in-text referencing. This is perceived to be the trickier of the two, although to be honest, it really shouldn't be. Every point that you need to make needs to have evidence and every piece of evidence that you use needs to be referenced. No matter your source, the general structure of an in-text reference is in parentheses, author last name, year of publication. When referencing OU materials, you need to be mindful of a few things. Firstly, is the textbook 
physical or electronic. If you're using the printed textbooks that are generally sent to you by the OU, you need to check and note down which year the book was printed. You'll find this within the first few pages of the textbook. For example, if your textbook was printed in 2018, write that down. If your textbook has been updated to 2020, write that down. If you're using an electronic version, you need to do the same. Throughout my studies, I had all my textbooks in my Kindle, which can be a big pain sometimes, especially if your module tutor prefers that you also use page numbers within your in-text citation. According to the OU Harvard guide, you can use the LOC number found at the bottom of your Kindle page. Honestly, I never did this. I was too chicken to try. Instead, I pulled up a PDF version of the textbook, searched for the specific sentence that I want to reference and took note of the page number that it's on. I found this method extremely helpful when writing up my reference list, which we'll get to in a moment. If your module is fully electronic, as in you don't have any physical textbooks, you need to be aware of whether there's a weekly author or not. In E313, each week's module site has its own specific author, where you would normally reference the Open University for anything that comes from the module website. If there is a weekly author, you have to instead reference it as week's author. This does not apply to audio or video materials. Number two, are you taking evidence from non-printed sources? Again, if you're using audio or video materials as the source of your evidence, the structure is the same for in-text references. Author, year uploaded. For example, Rogan, 2020, if you've picked something up from the Joe Rogan experience, whether in audio or video form. If you're using OU audio video materials, however, the structure is then author, year of module start, where the OU is always the author of the materials and the year of module start is the year when you started studying. If you're studying DE200 this year, for example, your reference would be the Open University, 2020, up until the time you're finished with your module. Question number three, is it a secondary reference? Throughout my studies, this was the referencing question that was asked the most, even when I was in level three. If you think about it, it's actually not that difficult. A secondary reference is when the source of your evidence is one that is cited by the author. You will see this a lot in your textbooks. Number four, to page number or not to page number. This is the most annoying question of them all, but in reality the answer is quite simple. It depends on what you have. Do you have a physical textbook? In that case, then yes, use page numbers and then your in-text reference will look like this. Chapter author, year of publication, followed by page number. If you're using a Kindle or any other ebook, you can use the location number instead of the page number. This is is especially important if you're picking a direct quotation from a source. If your module is online only, then you don't need to worry about page numbers, just reference as is, chapter author, year of publication. Now let's talk about the reference list. Reference list gathers all the references that you've used throughout your essay into one neat list. It should always be in alphabetical order. If you have multiple references published by the same author, arrange them chronologically by the publication year. If they've been published within the same year, then arrange them according to which you published first, second, third, etc. The general structure of your reference list entries should be as follows. Author surname, initial, year of publication, in small quotations, title of chapter, in editor surname, initial, in parentheses, 
EDS, italics, title of book, place of publication, colon, name of publication, and then the chapter pages. However, if you have online chapters, the reference list would be author surname followed by initial, in parentheses, the year you started the module, in small quotations, title of chapter, comma, italics, module code, colon, module title, in straight brackets, online, available at the URL of the relevant chapter and then in parentheses accessed the date you first read the chapter. If you're using an OU audio or video source the reference would be the Open University followed by year of module start in parentheses small brackets title of audio or video in straight brackets audio or video in italics module code and title available at in parentheses accessed followed by the date you first watched or listened to that audio video material. But if you've picked an item off of YouTube, the reference list would be in italics, title of the video, followed by in parentheses, the upload year, followed by YouTube video, comma, added by the name of the channel, in straight brackets online, available at the URL of the video, followed by finally in parentheses, accessed the date that you first watched this video. Be mindful of the format that I've used in all the above samples. You need to follow it to the T or risk getting an earful from your tutor with the exception of the curly brackets. Those ones you should just fill in with the appropriate details without the curly brackets. By the way, when you have a secondary reference in your TMA essay, the reference list entry will be that of the chapter author with no reference to the secondary author at all except for within your in-text reference. Let's work out an example. So using the TMA question I talked about earlier, let's define categories and then reference it accordingly. Everything we see on a daily basis has been stored away in our brains and filed into different categories created via mental representations. Mental representations are outlines of information of the world around us that our brains store in parentheses, Burke 2007, cited in Dioso 2018, and is believed to be the foundation of all mental processes guided by perception. Here I've defined categories as mental representations, and I've followed it by the definition of mental representations I found in my textbook and the chapter written by Gioso. Since E219 is an online only module, I didn't need to add a page number, but always confirm this with your tutor. Within that textbook chapter, Gerso cited another author, Burke. That then to me is secondhand information and should be then cited as secondary reference. You can think of it as Gerso told me about Burke's work or Burke's work was mentioned in Gerso's chapter. Because you picked your little nugget of information from Gerso, the reference list entry would look like this. Gerso, n 2018 because that's when I did my E209 study in small quotations, chapter four, representations in the early years, E209, part one, the early years, in straight brackets, online, available at the URL, accessed 12th of January 2019, because that is when I first read the chapter. Although Burke was the original author of the definition, since I picked up the information from Gerso, that means that they are my source of reference. Again, since E209 was fully online, that means that I need to cite the chapters according to the online method rather than the textbook method. Here are some of my TMA tips. If you're finding it difficult to write your TMA, here's a really good tip for you. Set some writing goals for yourself. I did this throughout my level three study and I wish I had started this earlier. You can start by writing in 5% or 10% increments. Write your checkpoints down where you can see them and tick them off whenever you've successfully reached one. 
I also rewarded myself after certain checkpoints like eating my favorite chocolate bar after 30%. So maybe you can think about doing the same for yourself. Tip number two. Your tutor will be using a set marking scheme to mark your TMA. So the most important thing that you need to do is to stick as closely to what the TMA question wants you to do as possible. There is no room for creativity here so don't even try. Tip number three, use your word count to its absolute maximum. What that means is that if your TMA has a 2000 word limit, use it all up but do not waffle. Although you tend to have a 10% leeway either way, meaning that you can safely write as little as 1,800 words or as many as 2,200 words, I recommend keeping as close to the original word limit as you can. Tip number four, avoid all the Facebook and WhatsApp groups that you've joined during your TMA period. I spent my final year in a social media sabbatical and was only in one WhatsApp group for E313 and I swear that it's so much easier to concentrate. It will only cause you grief looking at all the many different ways that the students are answering the same TMA question. Some people might believe otherwise but this tip is based on my personal experience and to be honest I don't think I would have gotten my TMA scores otherwise. Tip number five. Your first point of reference is always your tutor not your peers. Your tutor will be the one marking your TMA and one tutor has their own sets of expectations compared to another. Sometimes these expectations can vary drastically. One situation comes to mind when I studied E313, two different cluster groups would get completely different instructions on the same TMA question. So just to be safe, always double check with your tutor what they want you to do. Number six, don't be afraid to bounce ideas off of your friends, but avoid doing so in such a public manner, like on Facebook or WhatsApp groups. You do not know if someone will pick up your ideas and use it to answer their own TMA. This is especially troublesome if they submit their TMA before you do, because if something occurs outside the confines of the OU systems, they will not be able to help you. Tip number seven, you should not attach yourself emotionally to your TMA work. I know that this is also very difficult to do but there is always room for improvement in your TMA even if you're somehow scoring 100%. Detaching from your work allows you to better accept feedback from your tutor and it allows you to learn from any mistakes that you might have made before. And finally tip number eight, try to complete your TMA at least two days before your deadline. Use the extra days to run your essay through a grammar checker like Grammarly that is free to start with and it comes with a bunch of plugins for Google Docs and for Microsoft Word. If you subscribe to Grammarly Premium, they also have an academic option and it corrects the language that you use that might be too casual. I've Put a link in the description below so you can check it out for yourself. Understanding feedback. To be honest I was planning to make this section a bit more in depth than it currently is but halfway through writing the script I realized that I just can't. Tutor feedback can vary widely and so anything that I would have gotten from my personal tutors might be different from what you might get from your tutors but because this is an important aspect of the TMA process let's have a brief chat about it anyway. Here are some tips. Number one, always pay attention to both PT3 and complete feedback 
feedback files. Although PT3 is meant to be a summary, sometimes it gives you a better idea of what you need to work on for your future TMAs. Tip number two, take note of all the feedback from your Mark TMA file that you're either confused about or if you don't agree with it, note it down and then bring that up with your tutor for clarification and further discussion. Tip number three, sometimes the feedback that you receive might feel a bit generic to you as if your tutor simply copied and pasted things from a script but the truth of the matter is that is exactly what you need to work on final tip is if you live in the UK I highly recommend using the opportunity to have regular chats with your tutor especially in regards to the TMA whether it's in regards to the next TMA question or about your feedback that you've just received if you're an international student some modules will have a tutor group room which you can use to have one-on-one -on -one chats with tutors for free I've had this throughout my study but was was only offered to use it by my E219 tutor and it helped me so much for my EMA. Thank you Angela. <laughs> Next let's talk about some ICMA tips. Computer marked assessments or CMAs are mini tests that are done online in the module website. You will typically see them as ICMA or interactive CMAs on your assessment page. You could see them as like a little open book multiple choice pop quiz. They are compulsory to complete for modules that have them and they need to be completed on time as deadlines are not flexible. Although they're technically open book, they're not always easy. I've personally come across some ICMA questions that have very similar seeming answers and well, only one of them is correct, unless stated otherwise. I would highly recommend that you take your time with your ICMAs and to jot things down as you go. So you can use that as an anchor to look back at your module materials. Sometimes ICMAs require you to look back quite a while back. My DE300 ICMA had me looking back to DE200 module materials. Thankfully you will still have access to the previous modules that you've taken, albeit in a read-only form, meaning that you can't really do anything on them anymore but you will still have access to the educational information. Again I have to stress that you should take your time. You normally have between two to four weeks to complete an ICMA so don't be afraid to take it one question at a time. You're aiming to get a high percentile mark here and not simply just passing it. Although ICMAs tend to hold low percentages of your overall module result you still want to make the best out of it. Why? Because it could just very well be the little bit that pushes you to a better module result. So take your time. EMA slash EMTMA. Most modules will end with either an end of module assessment or EMA or an end of module TMA or EMTMA. What's the difference between the two? Well one is marked by your own tutor at the end of your module and the other will be marked by someone within the OU's examination body. I personally think that EMAs are tougher to get a higher score on compared to EMTMAs because they won't be marked by your tutor. Your tutor knows you by now. They know how you write. They know what you mean when you say this or that and interpret it appropriately. EMA markers do not. Some people do get better EMA results so it's really all about preparation and taking your time. Do not, I repeat, do not rush your your EMA. You will be making a big mistake if you do, especially if your EMA counts for 50% of your overall module result. So as soon as you have access to your EMA question, I recommend that you should write it down on a special EMA sheet. Every week, 
you should refer to your EMA question and if you've learned something that is relevant to the EMA question, jot it down on that EMA sheet. This way you can update your answer as you're going along with the module and you don't have to rush things later on in the module. Remember to note where you got your little nugget of information from. If you're juggling OU study with full-time work, make sure that you schedule in enough time per day not per week to work on your EMA during the preparation period. Use this time to understand the question or questions, jot things down and refer back to the module materials in order to fully formulate your answer. There's a reason why you have more or less a whole month to work on your EMA, so use it to your advantage. Now let's talk about exams. To be honest, I'm not really good with them, but because I wanted to do my best and I do believe that I did my best I worked really hard for me I had to take an exam for DE 200 so as soon as I was finished with my EMA for E219 I got right down to business depending on which degree that you take there might be certain requirements that the OU needs to fulfill in order for that degree to obtain accreditation for instance in order for any of the OU psychology degrees degrees like Q07 to be accredited by the British Psychological Society, students will need to sit for at least one examination throughout their bachelor's study. OU psychology students will sit for this exam instead of write an EMA during the level 2 study, more specifically while studying DE200. In terms of the DE200 exam, as far as I'm concerned, the structure is still the same as when I took it back in 2019. But do correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. If I had to describe it, I would say that the exam is quite similar to that of a psychology A-levels exam. I wouldn't know exactly for certain because I didn't take psychology for my A-levels, but I would think that it would be similar to the economics papers where you write this essay and that essay within a specific amount of time. The DE200 exam is split into two parts and you have three hours to complete the questions. Part one is worth 30% of the overall mark. It gives you eight terms or concepts out of the 45 that you've learned throughout your DE200 study. Then you need to pick three out of the eight and answer two questions for each term that you pick. Number one, provide a definition. And number two, explain how and why it's relevant to psychology. 26 out of the 30 module weeks will give you terms or concepts that you need to learn and memorize. You'll see them at the bottom of your weekly checklist on the module's homepage. Some like this. I highly recommend that you use flashcards when studying for part one. Write the term or concept down on one side of the flashcard and the definition on the other side in your own words. It's important that you define these terms in your own words because that's exactly what they need you to do during the exam. So it's best that you get started sooner rather than later. Beneath your definition you should think about why the term or concept is important to the field of psychology. Think of it this way. If this term or concept wasn't coined or studied, what would be missing from your education? What does the study of that term or concept achieve? How did it help psychology as a field? Hopefully by the end of week 26, you'll have 45 definitions and 45 reasons. Don't wait until the last minute to study them. Get these flashcards ready as soon as they come up on your weekly planner. Then use your study weeks to go over them with a family member, a girlfriend or boyfriend, your cat, your dog. Work on them until you can pull them out of the hat that is your brain as soon as you need them during your exam. Now, part two makes up the remaining 70% of your examination score. It's broken down further into two questions that look a bit like what you'll normally answer during your TMAs and you need to answer both of these questions. There's not really a set structure that's agreed upon by tutors at least not in my experience and you will not know the questions beforehand so 
The only advice that I can give you here is to learn your trade and answer those questions as if you are answering a TMA question. Split them into introduction, body, summary, conclusion. I think it's a safe bet to write about a thousand words for each question and pack that thousand words with as much information that you can fart out of your brain. You'll receive a specimen examination paper or SEP which you can download from the examination week the SCP will show you exactly what to expect in your examination. The terms will be different and the questions will be different, but the structure is exactly the same. Now let's talk about your degree results. If you're starting your level three study this year slash finishing your degree this year, then you're probably wondering what the process will be like after you're done. Firstly, you'll receive your level three module results. From here, you might already know what your degree classification will be. It's not exactly rocket science. Overall, your degree score will be calculated based on your level two and level three modules. There's a handy calculator available made by the OU Psychological Society or OUPS that can give you a rough idea of what scores you need to aim for in order to achieve certain degree scores. I've linked it in the description below, but if you're a bit skeptical about what the calculator tells you, you can just wait a couple of days after you've received your module results before your official degree score comes out. In my experience, you'll be able to see your results well before you get the email notification that tells you when your results come in. If you're happy with your results, then great. Congratulations in advance. But if not, I believe that you are allowed to dispute your results, provide that you have sufficient evidence to do so. And it has to be based on your module results. Phew! All right, that was a long one, but I do hope that it helped you in some way or another. Again, this whole video is based on my personal experience as an OU student doing the Q07 course, but you know, somehow I managed to get a first class honors, so that should count for something right? I'll say this again, if you have any questions in regards to your OU study, your first point of contact will be your tutor. But if you have any further questions in regards to anything that I've talked about today, feel free to leave a comment below and I'll do my very best to answer them. If you learned something today or if this video did help you, please, please give that like button a big clickety click and share this video with any of your classmates that might need the help. I have a few all your related videos coming out this week so please do hit that subscribe button notification bell optional so you know when those videos come out anyway that's it from me today i hope you're having a good day and i'll catch you in tomorrow's video bye